I promised a tutorial on the Nifty 50 lens, and here's the proof. So I'm going to tell you how to shoot and process this photo using only what you see here. No fancy telescope and no fancy tracking mount. You'll need a digital camera, a tripod, and the Nifty 50 lens, specifically the Canon EF 50 millimeter lens. Now the Nifty 50 lens is actually a really cheap lens. You can even get this used on eBay for about $60. As far as I'm concerned, this thing is the best budget astrophotography lens, especially if you're just getting into this hobby. It really should be called the Thrifty 50. So what are we imaging? We'll be taking a picture of the Ro Ofiuki cloud complex. That's Ro Ofiuki, and there's a lot to unpack here. This is the region of Ro Ofiuki, but because we're shooting with a Nifty 50, we'll capture all of this. Globular clusters, reflection nebulae, dark nebulae, emission nebulae, and of course, the Milky Way. Needless to say, this region is loaded with deep sky objects, and to image them, you'll have to go to a dark place. Ugh, where is that light? dark sky site, a place where you can see the Milky Way like this. One of the best resources for seeing light pollution is lightpollutionmap.info. Now for reference, I shot this image in Bortle Class 4 skies, so do your best to go to dark skies. Now the cool part is your settings on your camera will very closely resemble my settings, and that's because we're both shooting with the same nifty 50 lens, which is what we call a prime lens, meaning that it has a fixed focal length. Set your lens to manual focus and then set your camera to manual mode. For crop sensor cameras, you're going to use about 6 second exposures, and for full sensor cameras, it's going to be about 10 seconds. Now this isn't an exact science, but you don't want your stars trailing. You want them to look like this. Make sure to open the aperture the whole way, and set your ISO to about 3200. Also use daylight white balance and make sure you have a 2 second delay. Lastly, be sure to shoot in raw and large JPEG. Now if you're using an intervalometer, which looks like this, you'll also want to remove the shutter delay and you want to make sure your camera is in bulb mode because the intervalometer will take care of this for you. As a general rule, May through August is the best time to image this, regardless of what hemisphere you're in. Now Southern Hemisphere folks have an advantage because it rises higher in the sky for more months of the year. Now the earlier in the year you shoot this, the later you have to stay up. And that's because you want to shoot it when it's well above the horizon to make sure that you avoid the light dome. Also make sure you shoot it when the sky is less bright, so shoot during a new moon. To find Ro Fuyuki, look towards the core of the Milky Way for this bright star here, called Antares. This is what it looks like in the live view. Now this star is hard to miss because it's so bright, and it gives off this characteristic reddish-orange color, which appears somewhat similar to Mars. Once you've found Antares, use the digital zoom on your camera and zoom in the entire way. Focus your lens all the way to infinity. You'll notice that it's almost focused, but not quite. So actually slightly back off of infinity until you get it nice and pinpoint and looking like this. This is an in-focus star. Here's another pro tip. This lens is great, but it tends to lose focus. Hey, I need you to focus. To fix that, you can use a small piece of electrical tape and then place it on the focuser so it keeps focus. Once you've achieved focus, you'll want to reframe the subject. In my case, I moved Antares to the bottom right-hand corner because Antares is actually this star here, and I want to capture this region of the Milky Way. So reframe appropriately in order to capture the region. Once you've done that, go ahead and take 300 photos, or light frames as we call them. To compensate for the rotation of the Earth, you'll have to reposition your camera about every 15 to 20 images. To help you reposition between image sets, I'd recommend using the rectangle as a reference for reframing. As long as you keep Antares centered, you should be good to go. Immediately after the photos are done, you'll want to replace the lens cap and remove the shutter delay. Then you'll take 50 dark frames, which are essentially the same settings as the photos, and this will help us reduce the noise. After that, set the camera to the shortest exposure possible, and then take 50 bias frames. Again, we're going to use these to help reduce noise. Once you've finished and bagged all that great data, we'll move on to stacking, where we'll take a single noisy photo, combine it with a bunch of others, and get a much cleaner image. To do this, we'll use Deep Sky Stacker, and I'll cover all you need to know in under two minutes. Here we go. The first step is to upload the light frames or the photos. So click this button here, and notice how I've already organized things ahead of time, and this makes things much easier. Go into the light frames folder and make sure you're importing the raw files. Select the first one, scroll down to the bottom, hold down shift and click the last one. This will allow you to open them all. But we still need to check each of these boxes. You can either do this manually at a time, or you can left click the first one, scroll all the way down to the bottom, hold down shift, left click the bottom one, and then right click and click check. This will check all the boxes for you and import all of your light frames. Next, let's upload the dark frames. Go to the dark frames folder, and we're going to do the same thing by importing all of the dark frames. 
Once you've done that, notice that the dark frame is imported without the box checking. Lastly, we're going to upload our bias frames, which again will use the same technique that we use for the dark frames, so we don't have to worry about checking the boxes. After you've imported all those frames, go to register checked pictures. And notice the value in the center of your screen is 80%. We're going to change this to 95, which means that Deep Sky Stacker will select the best 95% of photos. Go to advanced, and then compute the number of detected stars. Deep Sky Stacker uses stars to help align the photos. Here we can see we've got about 500 stars, which is more than enough to align these photos, so we'll go to Recommended Settings. Now Deep Sky Stacker does this great thing where it puts the recommended settings in blue beneath red, so go ahead and click each of these blue links, and then go ahead and click OK. After you've done that, click OK again, and we're ready to stack. We have all of our light frames, as well as our calibration frames down below. Go ahead and click OK. Now stacking took me a little bit over an hour, so let's go ahead and make sure we speed things up. And you're done! And this is the location of your finished file. So now you're an expert in under two minutes. Now it's on to processing, where we use Photoshop to take this photo and process it to this photo. The first thing you'll need to do is go to Image Mode and change your mode to 16-bit mode. Also make sure you select Exposure and Gamma. Next, you'll want to create a new layer from Visible, and this is a great way to always back up your work as you're going about processing your image. Next, we're going to do a Levels Adjust, and we're going to take the far right slider and bring it to the edge. We're then going to take the middle slider and actually move it closer to the histogram. We're going to do the same thing again, and we're going to bring the middle slider closer still. Take the left slider and bring it as close as you can to the edge without going over and chopping off the data. After that, we're going to set our gray point, so we'll choose the middle eyedropper and click somewhere in the background where it's neutral. After that, create a new layer from the visible, and then we're going to do a curve stretch. So you're going to take the right side of the histogram and pull it up slightly, and then you're going to take the left side of the histogram and pull it down slightly. And this is going to bring out the nebulosity, particularly in Rho Ufuyuki, which is right here. Once you've done that, go ahead and click OK and we're going to set the gray point once again. Choose the middle eyedropper, click somewhere where it's nice and balanced, and then click OK. Then we're going to do another curve stretch, but this time we're going to focus on the nebulosity. So hold down Control, click somewhere in the nebula, and it'll plot it on the histogram. Then we're going to take that and pull it up slightly, go to the left of it and pull that down slightly, and this will bring out more regions of the nebulosity and help us see things a little bit clearer. And now we're starting to see more of Rho Ufuyuki, but we're not seeing much color. So let's go ahead and increase the vibrance and saturation, and bring out some of that color in Rho Ufuyuki. I wouldn't go too heavy handed on this, but it's okay to bring it up significantly, because we want to start to see the colors here. After that, create a new layer from Visible, and then next what we're going to do is get rid of some of this vignetting. The easiest way to do this is go to Filter, Camera Raw Filter, and then go to this option down here where it says 12%. Zooming out helps us see the vignetting. Then go under Optics, and go to Vignetting and pull it up slightly. We got some of it, and we'll take care of the rest of it later. Next, we're going to remove the star halos. So go to Camera Raw Filter again, and zoom in on a star and see how there's this nasty blue color. So we're going to use the Fringe option and pull the purple amount up until we see that nasty purple halo disappear. This is going to look a lot better and really help our overall image. After that, create a new layer from the visible. Now see how there's still this nasty vignetting? One way you can fix this, and it's perhaps the lazy way, is to crop it. And if you're not cropping out anything important, it's often a nice way to go about things and save you some time. So I'm gonna go ahead and crop out the worst of this. Now please, please, please make sure you uncheck this box in case you wanna uncrop your image. After we've done that, the other way we can fix vignetting is by using graduated filters. So go to Camera Raw Filter, and go again to 12%. We're going to go ahead and get rid of this vignetting by clicking this button over here. So if you click and drag, you can actually create a graduated filter. And by doing this, you'll be able to help change the settings and get rid of some of the vignetting. Now you can reposition it using the four arrows, and you can adjust the tint, temperature, and exposure over here to help blend it in with the rest of your image. That's really the goal right here, and there's not necessarily an exact science. It's all about making it look like the rest of your image, so you don't have this nasty, dark vignetting around the edges. Now that looks a lot better, and I'm pretty happy with it. 
but I'm going to go ahead and do another graduated filter up on the top to get rid of some of this darkness. And again, there's not necessarily a hard science to this, it's just that you want to try to match it to the rest of the image so that it blends together nicely. Now as with this whole workflow, there's not necessarily a specific order of doing things. I'm just showing you the way that I did them and a way that they can be done so that you can use these approaches when you go to process your photo. That's looking a lot better and a lot more natural to the image. Let's adjust this just a little bit more and that looks pretty good. After that, create a new layer from the visible. Once again, set the gray point by clicking somewhere in the neutral background. And then we're going to create a new layer from visible. Then we're going to do another curve stretch and again, hold down control and click in the nebula. We're going to bring that up slightly and then bring down the left ever so slightly again, bringing out more of that nebulosity and more of that contrast in the image. Go ahead and click OK. And then what we're going to do is fix this vignetting again by cropping because this top part is still bugging me. Now before you do anything else, we're actually going to save this as a 16-bit TIFF file because we're going to actually process this using a cool program that's going to remove stars. So choose a TIFF file name that you'll easily remember. Once you've done that, we're going to go ahead and move over to StarNet++, which uses a neural network to remove stars. So you can take amazing photos that look like this and turn them into starless photos that look like this. If you really want the technical details, here's how it's done. No. But if not, here's the download button. Once you've done that, you'll have to extract all the files from the zip file. Once you've done that, you'll take your 16-bit TIFF file and drag it into the unzipped folder. Then go into the folder and drag that TIFF file into the next folder. Once you're at this point, you have to take that TIFF file again and drag it onto RGB underscore starnet plus plus dot exe. And this will run starnet plus plus against your TIFF file and remove all the stars. After you've done, the starless.tiff file is going to be your output, and you're going to want to open that with Photoshop. And that's your starless Ro Fuyuki. Pretty cool, right? So create a new layer, and then we're going to use the spot healing brush to clean up some stars. Make sure the hardness is set low so that it's a soft brush. Go around all the brighter artifacts and clean them up so that the image is just of the nebulosity. This may take you some time, so once again, let's speed it up. That's what it looks like when it's completed, and you'll create a new layer from visible. Then we're going to increase the vibrance and saturation to bring out even more color in the Ro Ufuyuki region. We don't want to overdo it, but we do want to make it a little more prominent. Create a new layer from visible again, and then what we're going to do is actually copy the starry layer on our other project into the starless project. Once we've done that, line both layers, and you can do this by repositioning them to make sure they line up. One of the nice ways to check this is to toggle on and off the top layer to make sure they line up. After doing that, change the top layer opacity to about 75%, and then create a new layer from visible. And once again, we're gonna do another curve stretch. So we're going to go to the right of the histogram and pull that up, and then go to the left of the histogram and pull that down to bring out more contrast and nebulosity. Then create a new layer from visible, and then we're going to set at the gray point again, selecting the middle eyedropper and choosing a balance in the background. Now, notice we still have this nasty vignetting we haven't gotten rid of. So again, we're going to fix it by adding graduated filters. Now again, I'd recommend zooming out to 12% so you can see things easily. Now one of my viewers, I won't say who, challenged me to include the word diabolical in this video. So here it is. Diabolical. Now I'm not happy with that one graduated filter, so I'm actually going to add another one to fix this top area up here. Again, there's really not much of a science to it. You have to kind of play around with it to figure out what exposure, what tint, and what temperature will work best. I'll create a new layer from visible, and then I'll once again set a new gray point, something a little more balanced. That looks a lot better. After I've done that, I'm going to increase the nebula brightness and saturation, and there's many ways you can do this, but I like going to select color range, and we're gonna select just the nebula itself. So go ahead and click on that region and then adjust the fuzziness and range so that we're highlighting just that particular region. Go ahead and click OK and notice it's now selected. So what we're going to do is actually do an adjustment and then go to brightness and bring up the brightness so we really punch the brightness in this region of nebulosity. After that, you're going to create a new layer from visible again and we're gonna use the same selection criteria to once again select the same color range. 
but this time we're going to use a vibrance and saturation adjustment. And this is going to once again help maintain and bring out that color in Ro Ufuyuki. Now this part might take a little bit because once we've done this and created a new layer for this one, we'll have to do it for each of these other ones as well. So let's speed it up. And that's what it looks like when it's finished and it looks so much better. So again, let's select a new gray point to get a nice balanced image. And after we've done that, we're going to click OK. After doing that, we're going to do another curve stretch by holding down control and clicking in the bright area of the nebula and then pulling that up on the histogram. Then clicking on the left side and pulling that down. Not overdoing it, but bringing out more of that contrast. After you've done that, go ahead and click OK. And then we'll do another levels adjust in order to make our overall image a little bit less bright. Take the middle slider and pull it slightly to the right. Now this image looks really good right here and you can see lots of detail in all these regions, even the blue horsehead nebula. You could be done, but I'm gonna do a few more extra steps. The first thing I'm gonna do is actually crop out some of these noisy borders because again, they're a little bit distracting. After you've done that, you can reduce the overall image noise by going to Filter, Noise, Reduce Noise. And again, you have to play around with what settings work, but middle of the road tends to be conservative and tends to work pretty well. After you've done that, we're going to once again adjust the levels and make the image a little bit less bright. Take the middle slider and pull it to the right. You can repeat any of these steps as needed to finish processing, which is how I got this. I know processing is a bit more involved for this project because the exposures are so short but I bet you'll be surprised at just how much data you can pull out from your stacked image. And that's all it takes to take this photo. I hope you enjoyed it and thank you so much again for watching. If you like this type of content, consider subscribing, but until next time, keep your head up, clear skies are on the way.